And just as we move on to part two, and it won't take long, it's like a line, and then you're gonna move on to, into breakouts. Let me just highlight how much additional working and um, language is used, symbolic language is used around this that actually makes the proof clear, right? Even things like let, talking about what conditions your numbers meet. Um, you know, this kind of little explanation over here about why you can say that these things are integers because you can't just assume them, all of that. And then my conclusion, even my use of a little therefore symbol like that, all of these kinds of the things are classically missed in all the solutions that we've seen written by you guys because you focus on the part that seems like it's taking a lot of the cognitive load in terms of like, I'm thinking about the algebra, right? Um, and it's true, like this stuff is really important, but you guys know, because we've said it till, you know, you guys get sick of hearing it, that working mathematically is not just about crunching numbers and algebra, it's about uh, problem solving and reasoning and fluency, which you just saw, but also communicating. And all of this stuff that you can see here in green is kind of additional to just doing the algebra, right? So pulling out a result like this, um, yeah, hearty approval, um, but make sure you have all these other parts that show how the logic fits together, okay? So I hope that is clear um, and more, slightly more of a, um, a tangent than I intended to take, but I hope it was a helpful one. All right, part two. Um, for the number of you who are kind of thinking, yeah, tell me again what a contrapositive is, let me help you remember. Um, we've, I've stated, or I've kind of annotated here, um, that I've called this part of the statement A, or this part of the proposition is the language that the question uses, and I've called this part B. So if A implies B, A implies B, is our original statement, then our contrapositive, I wonder if you remember, um, requires us to do kind of two things, right? The contrapositive, it takes both of your um, A and your B and it negates them, right? So it's not A and not B that we're dealing with. And then it switches the order, right? So it sends it backwards. So it would be, um, if this is P, let me actually move this over. If this is P, then the contrapositive of P is going to be, it's a very long word to write. Not B implies not A. So once you know what A and B clearly are, then doing this like in words is all you need to do to get the one mark for this question, right? It just says, write down, no more reasoning is required, okay? So I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna negate each statement and say them backwards. So here is B, KQ plus one is divisible by three. So the negation of B would be KQ plus one, or I should have an if out the front, in fact if kq plus one is not divisible by three. There we go, there's not b. I'm now gonna imply, so I say then, and I look back at my a statement, so there it is, k plus one is divisible by three, so I want not a, so I'm just gonna say k plus one is also not divisible by three. Okay, so, that's it, part two, finished. One of the easiest marks in the entire paper, but it then gets followed by three of the hardest ones. So as promised, we're going to send you into breakouts in a second. Probably six or seven minutes, okay? Um, you're welcome to start writing a solution, but the thing that I want to emphasize is this is not about um, how you're actually going to present your solution. I want you to think through um, how to actually structure the solution, okay? Now, maybe it would be helpful um, before I send you into breakouts to just give you one more clue, which is just to make sure you understand you're all on the same page about the language of the question. It says, part three, Write down the converse of the proposition P and state with reasons whether this converse is true or false. So obviously the key idea here that's introduced, which we haven't had a look at in the rest of the question, is this converse idea. Uh, and you know, this is an important thing to kind of stop at because the whole issue here is if you've got a statement that's true, which we've just shown, proposition P is true, we just proved that in part P. Um, the converse of that statement may or may not be true. So part of this question and what makes it, I think, challenging why so much of the state did poorly on it is they don't tell you whether this thing is true or false. You've got to identify whether it's true or false and then prove whichever one it is, right? 
Now, let me just remind you that there's a couple of really obvious examples of when a converse can be true and when it can be false, right? So a classic one, I think, is that if you have a right angled triangle of any description, as long as you've got a right angled triangle, then you can know that its sides are going to relate in this particular way. The sum of the squares of the two shorter sides equals the square of the hypotenuse. Pythagoras' theorem. But importantly, the converse of Pythagoras' theorem is also true. If you get handed some random triangle and you have a look at its sides and you can say, oh, three, four, and five, it looks to me like a squared plus b squared equals, sorry, I wrote a, drew a right angle there, a terrible right angle for no reason. Um, if you know that those sides have this a squared plus b squared equals c squared relationship, that implies back in the opposite direction that this is a right angled triangle. So Pythagoras' theorem is true, and its converse is true. But there are loads and loads of statements that are true and their converse is not. For example, if you have a four-sided figure and you know that it is a square, then that implies that that same figure is also going to be a rectangle, which is to say all of the angles are 90 degrees. Being a square implies that you are a rectangle, but the converse is not necessarily true just because you've got a shape that's a rectangle. All the angles are 90 degrees. That doesn't mean it's also guaranteed to be a square, even if it is some of the time. So in this case, the converse is false. So here's gonna be your first job when you get into this room, right? How are you gonna determine, like, is this true or is it false? Um, what thought process will you go through because the question is not telling you? And then once you settled that, can you come up with a nice way or two or three even of how to actually prove whether it's true if it's true or it's false if it's false. So, my clock says 2.34. I'm gonna ask you all to get into your breakouts for the next six minutes, um, and we're gonna wander around Mrs. Lee's and I to have a look, and if you've got any issues or questions, or you're like, we're so done, um, just let us know. But let's just make sure we're in the same spot here, right? You remember the question is asking you a couple of things. It says, write down the converse, which I'm about to go through that in a second, and then state with reasons, uh, which is a bit cheeky, right? State with reasons, because state usually means like, just tell me, um, don't worry about reasoning. And then it says, eh, and tell me with reasons, right? Um, state whether this converse is true or false. They're trying to avoid some weird language around, prove the thing true if true, prove the thing false if false. So that's, that's what's going on here, okay? Now, in some of the breakouts, well, I think I made it to most breakouts um, that I chatted to. My first question to you was, do you think this is true or not? Because you don't want to spend a whole amount of time proving that this is true if it's actually false or vice versa, right? So the first question you have to settle for yourself, and a lot of the state didn't even make it past this hurdle is, is the statement true or false, right? So the way that I went about this, because I, I gave it a real go before looking at anything like a solution was, um, I need to kind of, well, I need to test some numbers, right? I need to get a vague sense of, am I heading in the right direction? Is it? Is it likely to be true or can I, like all I need is a single counter example and then I can know, oh, it must be false sometimes, which means I can't prove it true for all values of K, right? So what I just thought is I'll try some values of K and see what happens. And I need to cube these numbers and then add one, right? So one cubed is one, you add one, you get two. Uh, two cubed is eight, so that goes to nine. Three cubed is 27, so it gets 28. Uh, 64 turns into 65, what's this, 125 turns into 126, 216 turns into 217, 7 cubed, that's 343, so I get 344 here, and then 8 cubed, 64 times 8, that's 512, so I'll add 1. So this is what I get, right? Now when I have a look at this, I can say, well, which one of these which ones of these are divisible by three? And it's not too hard to verify, right? You're like, well, that's divisible by three, uh, that's divisible by three, and then um, 513 is five plus one plus three, so it's nine. So yeah, that's, that's divisible by three. So these are the ones, right? And importantly, importantly, none of the other ones are. Two is a dud, 28, 65, 217, 344. Now, even though these are all duds, right, it's very important to test these because these could have given us a counter example because when you have a look at well, what is k plus one then, you do, uh, no, no, no surprises here, get three, six, and nine, so k plus one, is divisible by three in each of these cases. But you couldn't test just three and six and nine, or I should say two and five and eight, because you'd be missing 
the possibility of counterexamples, right? You'd only be testing in this direction from k plus one to k cubed plus one. We've actually got to test everything here to make sure we know whether it breaks or not. Now, I haven't obviously gone very far, I only tested eight numbers. This is certainly not a proof, but it's a helpful indicator that the converse is probably true and it would be enormously sadistic. Like there's famous um, patterns that go for a really, really long time. Like sometimes hundreds or thousands of millions of numbers and then they break. Um, but we, it would be you know, unfair to give something like that to you in the context of a time pressured exam. So what I think I'm gonna try and do is prove this converse. Here's my B part of the statement and here's my A. So if KQ plus one is divisible, then A, K plus one is divisible, right? Now, how would we try and do this by a direct proof? How would that look, right? Well, if k cubed plus one was equal to three times some number, and then that implies that therefore k plus one is also equal to three times some number, that's how I would go at, go at it via a direct proof, right? But how do you even make progress on this? And I even saw some of the rooms trying to like wrestle with this, yeah? Um, how would we make progress with it? Because, you know, you'd have to do some kind of cube root operation to get, like, you've got to do some algebraic sort of operations to get from this to something that looks like this. And if you introduce a cube root, you're like, oh, I don't know, like k cubed equals 3n minus 1. And so I guess you've got the cube root of 3n minus 1 and then you'd, you'd add one, and I have no idea what's going on there, right? Uh, even though it's true. Uh, at least I'm assuming it's true if I know that this antecedent clause is, tr is sort of given, right?